Thank you. You can take your seats. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon, our Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Research, Innovation and Postgraduate Studies, Professor Eugene Kluter, Professor John Akudugu, and then also some of the special guests who are here this afternoon. Some of you have traveled a long way to be with us, and thank you for doing this. Mrs. Rose Akudugu, um, Miss Elizabeth Akudugu, daughter, and Mr. Elia Akudugu, who is his son. Welcome to the three of you. And then also there are some special friends in the audience. Dr. Antonio Serafin, who's a former colleague. Mr. Muhsin Hamid, it's uh, the, uh, Dr. Uh, Muhammad Hamid's father. And Mrs. Shanaz Hamid, who's uh, Mo's mother. Welcome to all of you. Um, I would, uh, I'm very happy to see you here. And I am the Dean, Professor Almi Muller. And uh, it is a great pleasure now to introduce to you our candidate, Professor John Akudugu. Professor John Mbabuni Akudugu was born in Ghana in Baku. And he is currently a full professor in radiobiology as well as head of the Division of Radiobiology in Stellenbosch University. He earned his BSc in Physics from the Kwame Nkuru University of Science and Technology in Ghana. His interest in the field of radiobiology grew out of his studies at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology, where he obtained an MSc in Biophysics and Medical Technology. After working as a medical physicist at the Ghana Atomic Energy Commission and at the Kourlebu Teaching Hospital for three years, he joined Stellenbosch University, and he then obtained a PhD in radiobiology. Following a one-year postdoc fellowship, he took up a second postdoc fellowship in clinical radiobiology at the University of Toronto. Professor Akudugu returned to South Africa as a research scientist at the Itemba Labs and as a visiting associate professor at Northwest University for the next four years. He then proceeded to work as a visiting researcher at the New Jersey Medical School in the USA for three years. He took up his current position with Stellenbosch University in 2012. Professor Akadugu really made a big impact in terms of his research. He has published more than 53 peer-reviewed publications in peer-reviewed international journals and has made numerous conference contributions. He also has three patents and 512 citations. Very importantly, he trained 26 postgraduate students and fellows with a huge footprint in the, in the uh, market today. He is an NRFC1 rated researcher and serves as both a grant reviewer and a member of a grant review panel. He's been a grant reviewer for the Cancer Association of South Africa and in the faculty he has helped to evaluate numerous postgraduate dissertations and assignments and including manuscript review of more than 10 international journals. He's also an editorial board member of the Journal of Cancer Biology and Therapeutics and has research interests in cancer therapy, modeling of tumor and normal, normal tissue responses to therapy, radiation sensitizers and protectors, and cancer biomarkers. Please welcome Professor John Akudugu to the podium this afternoon for his wonderful uh, lecture, Radiobiology, Born with X-rays over a century ago, yet virtually unknown. Thank you very much, Dean. Thanks for the honor to stand here and present my story. Uh, the story is going to be short. I hope we'll be out of here by 10, uh, 10 p.m. 
but uh, I would say a little bit uh, of a dedication, some acknowledgements, a little bit about radiobiology, my journey, and some conclusions and recommendations. I would like to dedicate this lecture to my parents and siblings of the blessed memory, Mr. Daniel Akudugu, Mrs. Elizabeth Akudugu, Mr. Paul Ayamba, Mr. Ayaba Akudugu, and my mentors, Professor Luther Baum, Emeritus Professor Richard Hill, and my mentee, Dr. Mohamed Bahif Hamid. Unfortunately, most parents couldn't make it here today because the mother is, has got an ear infection and they couldn't come to join us. But I would hope that they are able to connect virtually. I'd like to thank my family, Rose, Elizabeth, and Elijah. Thank you for running around the world with me that I may arrive here today. Even though some of the moves did not seem to benefit your progress immediately. Thank you. To our former Dean, Prof. Fulman, thank you for believing in me. Thank you and uh, to you and your management team for assisting me to get on my feet when I arrived 10 years ago. Thank you for all the support. I'd like to thank my mentors, <coughs> distinguished Professor Roger Har of Rutgers, New Jersey University, Emeritus Professor Edward Azam, Emeritus Professor Emery Elman, and Prof. Pitcher here with us. Thank you, Prof. Elman, for believing in me and keeping the links open even after my many attempts to run away from South Africa. You still managed to fish me back to this place. Thank you. Thanks, Prof. Pitcher, for guiding me through my journey on my second leg to the faculty. So we start off with the discovery of x-rays over a hundred years ago came with a lot of excitement and uh, Wilhelm Conrad Rankin, who discovered them, became an instant celebrity. Of course, there were some other scientists who were not happy because they were not named as discoverers of it because that equipment that he used to discover it, they had worked with it for many years but none of them saw the invisible x-rays. When he saw them, he actually said, well, let's call this one an x, just as we do in mathematics and physics, our unknowns always tend to be x. So this was an unknown ray, so he decided to name it x-rays. Of course, the name was changed well, and still runs around as Röntgen in most of the Scandinavian and German-speaking countries. Because he was initially a mechanical engineer, but got inquisitive and became a physicist. So uh, upon discovery of the x-rays, oops, sorry about this. His first images of x-rays were that of his wife's left hand showing the wedding ring and, of course, the skeletal uh, imprint of the hand. This one here is a picture of his hunting rifle showing some defect. And that there is a picture of a box containing weights. Of course, the picture of the hand is what has become radiology. So he, upon the discovery of x-rays, radiology started. This one here is used a lot in the industry 
to check for defects in parts. And of when you are flying, you would know all your bolts that are made, that the plane is made up of, have been checked for cracks and defects. This, of course, those who belong to my generation would know that we did not have electronic scales. So we used to actually balance known weights, weights with the, our unknown to be able to weigh. Of course, this also is used a lot in air, airports for checking luggage for security. Then a few years later, a few years later, radium was discovered. I'm sorry, I always get to the wrong one. Radium was discovered by Marie and Pierre Curie. That discovery was actually sparked by some interest that Marie had from Henry Becquerel's discovery of what he called spontaneous radioactivity. This would be electrons, I mean elements, that are emitting radiation. And of course, in their search, she managed to convince her husband-to-be who was interested in crystal structures to leave his research and join her in their search. And in the search, they found polonium and radium shortly after. Of course, polonium is a poison, and some of you may have heard about it being used to poison a spy in the UK some years ago. Radium also emits a lot of toxic radiation, but it also comes with a property of being luminescent in darkness. So because of that, it made a lot of big news and industry jumped in and use radium paste to paint watch dials. Of course, with that discovery, they won a joint Nobel Prize in 1903. But the property, the glowing property of radium in darkness became attractive and of course, watches, ladies, young ladies were hired to paint watches. And in the process of doing so, they were encouraged to straighten their brushes with their, between their lips so that the, the strokes would be very nice and neat. And in do, so doing, they ingested radium. They ingested radium, accumulated in their bones, and caused a lot of damage. So after some time, some of them were then dying. People were getting uh, their skeletons breaking. And on one occasion, there's a story of one of them who went to a, a, the dentist and her jaw fell off. So of course, that then had to go a, the legal way. People had to fight. The workers fought against company. And finally, they managed some, to get some compensation. Some of them actually spent their compensations taking care of their medical needs. But in every sad story, there's always a joyful one. So this young lady, May Keen, was employed by the same painting factory. But after working for a few days, she decided to leave the job because she said she loved her teeth so much she would not want to put anything she did not know in her mouth. That saved her, and she lived to be 107 years. Of course, the damage was unlimited because most of the workers actually took the paste home and decided to decorate themselves so when they were at parties at night in the dark, they would be glowing. But of course, it was supposed to destroy them. 
Then, as I, the title of this talk said, radiobiology born with x-rays over a hundred years ago, but yet still not well known. Even after the discovery, it had to go for decades before this gentleman discovered the genetic effects of x-rays. And it is the genetic effects, of course, that end up leading to the visible damage that we may see. So he, in his discovery, also won a Nobel Prize in 1946. And here I have it that radiobiology is not the same as radiology. If we take up the bio, we have radiology. And there are many occasions where I would say radiobiology and people say, you mean radiology? Because radiology is quite popular, but radiobiology, unfortunately, not that much. Even though at the invention, I mean, discovery of x-rays, the biological effects of x-rays were supposed to already be exhibited. And these are just some visible examples of what radiation can do if you are not aware of it. So this is an example of a nuclear disaster that led to mutations in flowers. There's this calf with double heads, and these kids came out with some deformities. This is an example of, of course, there's a lot of scrap work going on. This is a welder who actually inadvertently picked up a very he a strong source of radiation and put it in his pocket and kept it for about three and a, I mean six and a half hours, complained of back thigh pain. Then the pain devolved into that, and he actually ended up losing that right leg. When he got home, he took off his pants and left it on the sofa. The wife also inadvertently sat on the pants for about 20 minutes to feed their baby and got some radiation burns that actually went two years down the line, very necrotic and fibrotic. So of course it's understandable when people say no radiation in my backyard. Of course we don't see it, we don't smell it, but when we know how to use it, it is an advantage. So radiobiology deals with understanding how radiation causes the biological effects. How does it cause damage to cells? Of course, it can be found, you can find radiobiologists working in any of these areas. In academic settings like ours, we may be part of a radiation oncology division or department, a radiobiology department, nuclear medicine, radio diagnosis, radiation protection, or what is called radio ecology. That would be looking at protecting the environment from the, bio, uh, the effects of radiation. There's also space science. In space science, you have radiobiologists working there for protecting, looking at protecting astro astronauts. In agriculture, Radiation is used for uh, fruit and seed preservation. Bioremediation, that's where you would have radioactive waste dumped at places. Radiobiologists can engineer microorganisms like bacteria to actually help in cleaning up the environment. Just one example of where radiobiology could be used, and a very common one is in radiotherapy. And in this group here, we've got some of our radiation oncologists who would agree they, they benefit a lot from radiobiology. In conventional therapy, the rule of thumb is to use about two units of radiation to treat a tumor a day and you could go for about five to six weeks on therapy. 
This treatment is guided by radiobiology, by understanding how the tumor would behave and how to actually treat it. So we then find out that the capacity of the tumor cells to repair the damage caused by the radiation plays a role. Where the cell is in its attempt to divide plays a role. The amount of oxygen in the tissue plays a role. So the more oxygen there is in the tumor, the more sensitive that tumor would be. Here, how fast does this tumor divide? If it is a fast div dividing tumor, it will be more sensitive to radiation. So, and of course, with some help of some equations, we would be able to model and predict how that tumor would respond to that. But here we also have tumor spreading. You've got your primary tumor. Some bits may spread to other organs. So when you focus on treating that, you do nothing to this. That also grows. But with advancement in radiotherapy, there are now ways of giving a large dose of radiation to the tumor, very few fractions instead of the six-week treatment. You may give for one week, and you are done. So what radiobiologists have found is that they are repair of the damage where the cell is in the division circle, content of uh, oxygen, and its capacity to divide frequently. And of course, those equations that were used no longer can help you to predict how this tumor would behave. Because that, the, the damage is so much, you actually kill the tumor. And because the damage is so much, one school of thought is that the damage, there's a lot of damage to the vascular system that leads to the release of cytokines and that triggers the patient to actually enhance his or her immune system. So the enhanced immunity then goes to kill the distant tumor, the one that you did not actually irradiate. That's one application. So radiobiologists are now left to trying to see how they can actually incorporate the immunogenic tumor cell kill in their equations for better prediction of this kind of approach. Another application is when we add other agents in combination to the radiation that we use, the idea is to try to make the effect of radiation even more prominent. And those could be some radiopharmaceuticals, chemotherapy drugs, or inhibitors of cell pathways because cells use certain communication systems to survive. But the problem here is that each of these agents, when you give to a tumor, the cells do not take them uniformly. So because of that non-uniform uptake, you actually may end up having some cells that would be able to survive the treatment. So you may get some kind of success initially, but after some years, there is the so-called recurrence that comes back to bite you. And to demonstrate that, these are pictures that are very common from nuclear medicine. So you may see some lesions here. Nice. So you would think that you, your drug or your activity has been taken up appropriately. But when you slice it, this is what you get. You would get a, a place areas of very high activity and areas of very low activity. The same thing here in some of these organs up here. So the organ does not take up the activity evenly. So if you assume your organ to be your tumor, then that organ is not going to be completely controlled because the cold areas 
are going to be survivors. To see that uh, in another picture, we, this is an example of the polonium I mentioned earlier to demonstrate that what we are saying is actually true, that if you take a cell population and treat that single, same, uh, that single cell population with a certain amount of polonium, you would find out that the uptake is such that some cells do not take up much of it and for that matter would survive. So that would be a non-toxic uptake and those we would refer to as the ugly cells in your tumor. The bad ones are those who pick up a bit, so they pick up what you may refer to as semi-toxic amounts of your drug. But when you have passed the threshold, this, these cells here would pick up very high amounts of it, and then they would die. To demonstrate that at the single cell level, these are individual cells that have been taken up after treating them with polonium and prepared for the alpha particle tracks. So as the particles are emitted, they form a track in a film. So you can develop that and then you say, okay, this, this group of cells in C here, they took up quite a bit and there are so many uh, alpha tracks. So these would be the ones that would die. This group here would pick up very little. Some may die, but some may survive. So the survivors are the bad ones, and those that did not pick up the activity or the drug at all would be the ones that would survive and be your problem in future. So, our proposed strategy for that is that instead of treating with only agent A or B or C, you try to treat with at least two of these so that this group here that did not pick up quite significant amounts of the drug may end up picking up high amounts of drug B or C and those that did not pick up high amounts of B may end up picking high amounts of A or C. And those that did not pick up high amounts of C may pick up high amounts of B or A. In that case, then, you would be able to cover your whole population to an extent that you will have a significant effect for your therapy. So what I've said so far is just a few examples, as I say, of course, for time. Radiobiology is everywhere, and we have indicated that it may be found in all these fields here. But the challenges that radiobiology faces now are those of identity, because we are so scattered, we do not seem to be able to have a, a strength, and that is why, probably why we are not known. So some radiobiologists even call themselves cancer immunologists or just biologists without the radio. The other problem is there is no dedicated funding and since this is a research intensive field, without funding there will be no research and there will be no growth or recognition. And even in developed countries, less than 5% of funding is used for career development in the radiation sciences. There is no clear pa career path, even though radiobiologists are involved in all these fields. And then, the, all the fields here are actually very interested in developing the, uh, technological advances instead of looking for scientific knowledge. And that is probably why there is a little bit of a difficulty in finding radiobiologists, not only in South Africa, but across the world. Succession problems is also huge because there's a huge age gap between 
senior radio biologists and the young ones. So now that I have introduced us to a little bit of what radio biology is, I would like to beg for a bit more time to celebrate all the people that have been involved in my journey. And to the young people, for every journey, if, whether it is in the academia or elsewhere, you need networking. So try to maintain your bridges, that they are nice, and when you want to cross from A to B, you would be able to cross without being hindered. If your bridge is like this, or that, or that, then you run into the trouble of maybe attempting to jump, and then you fall in there, you don't know what is under there. So maintain your bridges as you grow. You would need them sometime. Find somebody to guide you, and when you have been adequately guided, hold somebody else's hand and guide them. You need perseverance, because there are no easy ways to any, anything. So this gentleman down here does not want to chase for long. So he ends up with only a 30% kill rate. The great white is somewhere in the middle, but this guy is very persistent and he could chase for hours. So he ends up with an 80% kill rate. So don't give up even when you hit a brick wall. Your strengths and weaknesses, know them, and use them to your advantage. So if you are a bear, you don't try to fish like an eagle. Stick to what you do best for success. Now the journey begins, and I was born in Boku, in the northeastern corner of Ghana, and growing up was fun. This was my playground and steady. This one here would go up with either a stone, a slab of stone, or some sticks, sit on it, and slide down. That was fun. And occasionally I would get a chance to hang in, the, in, the, in this tree and steady. So from Primary school, I went to secondary school in Navrango, 110 kilometers away from Boku, but it could take about two to three days to get there because there were no cars. So you, could, you would then go from one village to another village and then come there and try the following morning. So after Notre Dame, I went to Nantam Sec for what would be grades 11 and 12 here. And after that, went back to Notre Dame to teach for two years. But one interesting point is that on one occasion, we got transportation only up to this point, 30 kilometers away from school in the middle of the night. So we had to carry our boxes and walk the 30 kilometers. So after the two years service here, I went down to the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology in Kumasi. After that, to Norway for the masters and came back to Accra to work for three years before coming to SA. And up here is a picture of my friend of blessed memories, Roger Amali, and I, somewhere around our final year before I went to Nandam Sec. And when I went back to teach, I got the opportunity to be the basketball coach. So I did some sports too. Then the international bit from SA, 
to Canada, back to SA, to the US, back to SA. So it's about time not to go anywhere else. <laughs> so I started with this faculty in 1998. After a visit here in 1996, I asked Prof. Elman if there was radiobiology around, and he intro she introduced me to Prof. Lotter, born, and we went into communication. There were no emails, so it was to write handwritten and fax. So I would write my letters handwritten and fax to him, and the whole thing is he wanted to take me, but there was no money. So after he got the funding, I came to join the group, and this was the group at the time. And in this crowd, we have Dr. Seraphine, and the rest. This is uh, Dr. Terino Teron, that we all know very well. And from here, under his guidance, these were some of the outputs. So from now, where applicable, I would just list the outputs. I would not refer to them. Thank you, Luther, for your guidance. This is University of Toronto. I was under the guidance of Professor Emeritus Professor Richard Hill of Blessed Memories. Thank you, Prof. Hill. Then, when I came back from Canada to Itemba Labs, I got the honor to mentor these young people. Ms. Dimpo Mururi, now Regional Quality Manager, Sub-Saharan Africa Cluster of S.C. Johnson. Dr. Boseo Mokaleng, lecturer at the Swan University of Technology. Mr. Hau Opalewa Sansuere, you should call him GP, senior scientist, Nuclear Energy Corporation of South Africa. He should have been here. I haven't seen him. I hope he's fine. And Mr. Timothy Sabila, senior specialist, national nuclear regulator. At Rutgers, I had the privilege of being mentored by distinguished Professor Roger Howell and Emeritus Professor Edward Azam. Thank you, Roger and Ed, for your guidance. There, too, I got the opportunity to mentor Dr. Manuel de Bonano, Associate Research Scientist, Columbia University. Professor Naeem Ali, Assistant Professor of Radiology, University of Vermont, and Dr. Frank Portugal, a nephrologist in New Jersey, Dr. Jordan Pastana, orthopedic surgeon, New York. Thank you for listening to advice. And then the second leg at the faculty, when I arrived, yes, when you, when you walk in there on a normal day, the first person you would probably meet is Uncle Daniel. <laughs> Uncle Dan, and of course here we've got Mrs. <coughs> Somikazi Bulana. I put this there just to represent the face of the faculty because you would have your security, and then for you to walk on a very clean corridor, you would need people like Sister Somikazi. Thank you for making the place a, a conducive environment for work. So the second time, 2012, when I got to the fifth floor, it was Prof. Baum, Dr. Seraphine and Uncle Clive. Three years later, the team was transformed to that. 
thanks to the support from the faculty. Thanks, Prof. Eugene, for your support. Every bit helped. And of course, you need a friendly environment. So I happen to belong to medical imaging and clinical oncology. And in that environment at the time, we had Dr. Kronewald, head of medical physics, emeritus Professor Elman, nuclear medicine, Prof. Pitcher, radio diagnosis, and Prof. Simons, radiation oncology. I thank you for having been with you for nine year, 10 years, I think, 10, 10 years, and I don't have any bad experience, no quarrel. It is always a friendly environment. You need that to grow. There's no toxicity. And of course, then got the honor to mentor these young people. I've got Dr. Hamid of blessed memory who was a lecturer until his untimely passing in 2001. Dr. Roswitha Hamuniela, lecturer at the University of Namibia. Dr. Sachaba Maleka, currently a third year MBCA CHB student here at the faculty and doubling as a research associate with us. Dr. Angela Chinengo, lecturer with us. Dr. Bayanika Maninu, lecturer with us. Thank you for listening to advice. And of course, to complete the radiobiology story, Mo, Angela, and Sechaba got their masters in radiobiology before proceeding to do their PhDs. And just recently, Mr. Muteba Keon graduated with his masters. I got an honor of mentoring Ms. Bianca Haman, an NRF intern who was recruited by Professor Vikas Serum. We got success and she ended up proceeding to obtain her honors and masters in medical microbiology. She is now an intern at the NHLS. Last but not the least for radiobiology, we have Dr. Seraphine and Dr. Daniel Acher. Dr. Seraphine with us, now retired, even though I still poke him occasionally. And Dr. Daniel Achel, researcher at the Ghana Atomic Energy Commission. This is an example of successful interdivisional or interdepartmental collaboration. So I've got the honor to mentor <coughs> Dr. Jean Paul Milambo with the Department of Global Health. She got her PhD in epidemiology and is now a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Free State. Collaboration with radiation oncology. Got the honor to advise Dr. Dorothy Lumbe, now radiation oncologist in New Zealand. Dr. George Pukwe, Pukwe, now radiation oncology in Zambia. Dr. Salani Chebe, radiation oncology with us, and I am honored to have Salani with us in here today. Dr. Walid Beck, radiation oncology with us, and Dr. Abba Malum, radiation oncologist with the University of Thank you, Abba, for coming.
interdivisional collaboration with radiation, radio diagnosis. What an honor to mentor Dr. Zakaria Valda, now radiologist here in Cape Town. Some conclusions and recommendations. And I talked about identity crisis being a problem for radiobiology. Of course, this is because we do not have an easy path to register radiobiologists because we are somewhere in the gray zone. You, if you don't work with patients or patient material or patient data, then you don't need the HPCSA. But then, in our setting, in an academic setting like this, it would be nice to do so, but they insist that whether you've got a PhD or you are a professor in radiobiology, you must do an internship. And we, unfortunately, we do not have in, an internship program here in South Africa for radiobiology. That is still uh, being worked on. So that needs to be straightened up. The dedicated funding that is not there, there's the need to establish some sort of dedicated funding for radiobiology. Otherwise, we may see a demise in this field. The career paths I talked about, all these fields that I mentioned should actually have some dedicated radiobiologists with them. But it does not seem to be a requirement, so everybody operates without a radiobiologist. That would be necessary. The emphasis on technological advances should also be pushed towards scientific advancement, so that radiobiology being research intensive would need to have some support for the research to grow and the training to grow. The succession issues that are there because of the huge age, age gap could actually be dealt with if some investments were made in training young academics in the field. And with this Ghana's Independence Day picture, I would like to say thank you for your audience. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Ukuduga, and good evening, uh, colleagues, and also online. But what a fascinating uh, career, and what an incredible journey, starting with the discovery of X-rays way back in uh, 1895, talking to us about what radio biology means, and giving us the many applications uh, for radio biology and the careers, and as you rightfully in, uh, indicated there, the lack of definition, perhaps, of a particular career. But that, in a certain sense, is true for physics, it's true for uh, biochemistry, it's true for chemistry, where there's not a, a clear career path, but many, many applications uh, of, the, of the knowledge. Uh, I also enjoyed listening uh, while you were explaining uh, all the anti-tumor mechanisms, but also sharing with us the strategy that one could follow. Uh, to be more effective. And then also for highlighting uh, the challenges for radiobiology, like you concluded with here. I also want to commend you with the uh, advice that you have given, specifically our uh, younger uh, colleagues, uh, about networking, about mentorship, uh, perseverance, and importantly, just to be yourself. Now, and when you ended off, uh, you uh, shared your personal journey, and uh, you know, in our uh, field uh, as academics, uh, we enjoy helping others. And I am extremely impressed with the number of people that you mentored. Um, you become significant and you have a significant career when you start helping other people to achieve their goals, and when it is not only about success and achieving uh, your own goals, and I would like to commend you for that. Uh, congratulations on being a professor. We are very fortunate to have someone of your caliber here at Stellenbosch University and also in the faculty, and I wish you well 
with your future career at this university. Thank you very, very much. And I will need you to come up and join me. There we are. And congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Colleagues and friends, as you all know, these inaugural lectures are such a central part of our university and a, a wonderful celebration of academic life and a, a platform for the candidate to tell us um, who he is and what his body of research was. And, and we certainly enjoyed that so much. So thank you for that. Um, thank you, Professor Kluter, for your wonderful remarks and for being here and for supporting us in, in, in uh, celebrating John's career. So all that remains now for me is to thank the people in the audience, um, also the organizers who helped us uh, organizing this event. Um, as you probably know, this event can't happen uh, without so many people playing a role and uh, for, for all their hard work. So firstly, I would like to uh, thank uh, Mrs. Megan Ceylon, who is part of our marketing and communication uh, group, and for her organization and the time and effort that she's put into this, um, and Renell and her team who are also now have been supporting her a lot. So thank you for organizing this. Um, then Mr. Menwin Sambur, who is uh, our audiovisual assistant tonight. Mr. Justin Alberts for the video and uh, for tonight's uh, video videography. Um, Celine Gallant, who uh, is our facility preparation manager, and also the campus security who uh, remained late to assist in this event. Um, it was a very special organizing uh, evening, and I, I want to really thank you for, for being here. So with this, I declare this evening closed. I would like to invite you all to come and have um, a small snack and drink with us in the Dean's uh, area at the, at the bottom of this corridor. And thank you for being here. Thank you for your presence and for celebrating um, a wonderful evening with John. Um, I hope you enjoyed it and um, I hope we can still uh, have a little bit of conversation with you after this event. <laughs>